maybe. Okay. <laughs> maybe enough people complained. <laughs> ah, why does it always talk to us? <laughs> mm. um, well, we'll start, I'll start with the collect for this next week. Grant, O oh merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. And tonight, instead of asking where we start, um, I want to start, and we'll probably spend a fair amount of time with the gospel for this next Sunday, John 6, 56 through 69. Uh, would someone like to read that? Anyone? I've got it, and David's okay. got it, so okay. either one. All righty. Go ahead, Lord. Okay. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not, do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by my father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was really happy when I realized that this week that I would get to close this arc of our lectionary readings in John. Um, this, we've spent a long time, uh, a number of weeks going through John 6. Um, and John 6, well, I mean, there are different focuses, different things you can draw from any part of John, but John 6 uh, is one that has always stood out to me in the same way that I keep returning to the prologue of John. And John's gospel, I mean, I, I still remember my reaction to it the first time I read the gospel from beginning to end. I think it was 11 or 12. I know where I was in Houston. And I was exploring all sorts of different things at that time. But uh, John's gospel has always, and John's epistle, epistles have always uh, spoken to me in particular. And so since we were concluding it here, I wanted to remind everyone so that everyone has the full arc of John 6 in their mind, how we got to the gospel reading today and the context in which it stands. John 6 starts with John's version of the feeding of the 5,000, uh, the only sign, the only miracle recorded in all four gospels. Um, after that, they leave, and we have the walking on water sign with the disciples. But the crowds, they're, they're trying to get away from the crowds and rest, but the crowds find them. 
again. And Jesus tells them, well, you're coming after me because you want bread. I fed you and you want more bread. And, and but, you know, there's the bread that, you know, you eat this bread and you're going to be hungry again tomorrow. Uh, there's the bread that, uh, that doesn't last. And when they, they ask him about this bread, you know, that's when he makes some of the I am statements that are unique to John. Uh, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And he refers back to, uh, to Moses in the Exodus and the manna in the wilderness and the story of the manna. And he ties that to him. Uh, but he does it in a way that also going back to Moses ties it to the burning bush. Because in John's gospel, when he uses I am, I am is uh, when Moses was uh, at the burning bush and God's trying to get him to go lead the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. You know, he says, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you will say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am is the tetra, is the English version of translation of the te tetragrammatron, uh, which is transliterated into our alphabet YW or yeah, YW or YHWH. Uh, also Yahweh. Uh, it's, it's the name of God. So Jesus in those statements is associating himself with God, with the I am. And you see that in the reaction. It disturbs people. Sometimes when he does it, they try to kill him. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but he challenges them and they go away. And then he says, uh, as they keep complaining about it to him, and how can he be this? How can these be true? He pushes it further. That's when he starts telling them that uh, that the bread I shall give is my flesh. And that's actually a part in Greek. In, in different times, you've heard me talk about how Greek sometimes has words that don't. We struggle to translate. It makes distinctions and that are hard to translate into English. Well, in just about every language, these distinctions are pretty easy to, because they're, they're there. They're there in English. They're, from what I understand, they're there in Aramaic. They're there in just about every language that I've, I've heard anyone reference. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to refer to the material. You know, we have body. In Greek, that would be soma, uh, and we use it in different places. That's not the word he uses here. Sarx is the word for that stuff that's sticking on the bone of an animal or a human. If you go to the market to get meat to serve for your deal, that's sarx. Uh, he's talking about you know the physical flesh. And John starts off that way. In the prologue, he says, the word became flesh, sarx, this physical body, not just soma. Um, and in, you know, Jesus would be speaking Aramaic, but the same concepts are true in every language. We make that distinction across all languages. And he is using the bluntest, most direct term. And you know their initial thing is to try to figure out what he's meaning because that's that was very common. If if you've studied the Mishnah, the you know any of the other ones, it's very common. It's it's uh, the rabbinic tradition, particularly that Jesus was operating in. Uh, we see lots of exploration of what do these things mean? How can we interpret this story? A lot of different interpretations, all of which are given validity. Uh, that that's fairly normal. And instead of encouraging that, Jesus keeps doubling down. You know, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, uh, you have no life in you. So now he's, he's adding his blood to, the, to, the, to this image, this picture. 
And you see these crowds beginning to shrink. Um, at first, it was the crowd of all these different people coming from everywhere around. And then it starts moving down to uh, his followers, um, you know, because they start leaving away, you know, moving away as he does that. Uh, and now he's teaching in the synagogue. And these are actually his followers, his disciples, for the most part. And he tells them these things. And they, you know, they, this is this is a hard saying. And he doubles down again. You know, does this offend you? Uh, and when he finishes this week, doubling down yet again on his statements, on what he's saying, even most of his followers leave, his disciples. Uh, now, you know, a lot of times we associate disciples with the 12. The 12 were the closest, the core group, the ones called representing the tribe, you know, the people, the tribes of Israel, the sons of, of Jacob. But he had, you know, he sent out the 70 earlier. He had large groups that followed him, that followed his teachings, that, you know, showed up, that went with him. Uh, a lot of women, too. A lot of different, you know, mostly supported by women, uh, wealthy women. Um, but now the disciples leave. He has doubled down. He has pushed them so hard. And so he turns to the 12. And he asks them, well... Are you going to leave too? Everybody else is gone. Are you going to leave too? And it's in that context that I hear Peter's answer. And, you know, Peter picks up steam as he talks and he gets to a kind of a bold declaration. But his starting point is, uh, Lord, to whom can we go? Where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. It's not a declaration speaking for the 12 that they understand because they didn't, not, not, at, not then. They did later, but not then. But it's a, uh, a declaration of we have found life in you. Where else are we going to turn? Where else are we going to go? Um, that's what John 6 does. It pushes, it pushes, it pushes, it pushes. And it pushes against this question. And of course, it's written long after the Passion, long after the, the Last Supper, uh, the institution of it, the development of the practice of the Eucharistic meal and the Eucharist. Uh, so all of that's infused in this story uh, as it's told. Uh, but it's pushing a question that was as difficult then as it is now. We proclaim, the gospel proclaims, uh, our practice, our tradition proclaims that we are consuming the body and blood of Jesus. And by doing so, we are consuming God. And that is part of the process of gaining life. It works to dispel the idea, the, this, this, particularly this telling in John, works to dispel the idea that it's merely a figurative story, that it's merely metaphorical. It pushes it to the extreme, but it does not explain it. It leaves us with the tension that this is bread and wine, and this is the body and blood of Christ and does nothing to resolve that tension. And that's true of a lot of things in Christianity. How can three distinct persons with distinct identities, with different ways of being, the unbegotten, unbegotten uh, the begotten, the one that proceeds, um, be one God? Christianity, that theme comes up again and again and again from the earliest text, from our scriptures, from all the writings. But even when it's articulated most clearly by St. Gregory, the theologian of Nazianzen, 
uh, and I think he captures it best in his poetry, not in his essays, is still not explained. It's just presented as these opposing ideas that we, that we believe. How can Christ be fully God and fully human? And recognize that most of the, the problem in the first century and most of the centuries after that, most of the problem were with Christ being man. In, in the ancient, that, that sounds kind of odd to people today, but in the ancient world, the idea of demigods, the idea of divinized people, the ideas of emperors being divinized, Rome rulers being divine, were kind of common. It was the idea that Jesus was actually human really human, truly human, that comes up again and again in the councils. Okay, maybe he started that way, but his human nature was obliterated. It was overwhelmed by the divine and it became fully divine. Well, okay, he was fully human and fully divine, but the divine will just directed everything that he did and it didn't allow him to actually have a human will because it just overpowered it. These were the tensions. These were the, dis these were the things that people kept having a hard time with. And the, the pushback again and again and again is no. Every, that which is not assumed, that which is not part of us, human, that is not in Christ, is not healed, is not saved. Uh, Christ has to be one of us for Christian theology to work. Um, so that's why I love this this tension because it pushes that in there. It pushes us in the place of Christianity, the place where we are expected to believe impossible things, opposing things, and hold them both as true, and then go out and live within that tension. Love within that tension. We consume bread and wine we eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. And in so doing, we have life and we abide in Jesus and he abides in us. That's what John 6 says. Our humanity is healed as we take Jesus into our bodies. We move toward God as we consume the divine. So I said a lot there. And as I said, I'm, I'm very passionate about John 6 in particular. It's, it's a part of the scripture that has meant so much to me that I come back, that I see more in. And I didn't even read a fraction of my notes just because I, and I knew I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> um, that has meant so much to me. So I, I wanted to share some of that passion, some of, some of what I draw from it. And so with that, I want to open up the floor to, what anyone else sees in it, what anyone else draws from, from the end of this, where, where this, this narrative ends in our gospel this next week. Because it's, yeah, the ending is, is odd. Um, or any of the whole arc. Yeah, John. Yeah, I was just it, it, curious to the, see, I wasn't aware whether this, this, these, statements saying of Jesus were in the other gospels. And the little bit I Googled it, it seemed to say these are this this in particular, this this dialogue or these statements of Jesus were not in the other gospels. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. I mean, John is the last gospel and the other all the gospels and I was looking Googling <laughs> and all the other gospels, all the gospels have the Last Supper. I'm thinking to myself, mm -hmm. well you know what's what's the parallel to this this and if the quickest one you think of is the last supper yeah you know and i i do tend to agree with you that i think what you're saying scott i mean in, in a sense of telling the story this this passage and this pushes the envelope in a big way you know i think you can you can read you can read the the uh last supper and come away with the idea that jesus was was being speaking symbolically or whatever you know about about the bread and the wine himself you know and maybe you and people could probably read john this past john that way if they wanted to but i think it's more it's as you say it's much it's more much more daring you to uh believe in something uh magical and beyond you know 
beyond human understanding. I think uh, that 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 does that that strikes me as it. And of course, it gives me pause too. I've been reading a lot of. I'm reading a book lately called Veritas. A very interesting book. It's kind of it's it's a book basically about the a phony a phony a phony a non canonical gospel that came up in the 2000s and and it was called the Gospel of Mary's wife, the Gospel of Jesus' wife, and mm -hmm. posits that Mary Magdalene is, is Jesus is a wife and there's, there's, there's a, a, an old papyrus from the you know the third century that 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 has that and it turns out to be a forgery and this this journalist just falls all over all over the world figuring the whole thing out it's very interesting but it just makes me think you know i'm thinking wow all these things are written over hundreds of years and everybody's you know uh looking at the gospel stories and the life of jesus and what they think about it you know and this one's this one in this instance seems like it's it's, it's a later version it's it seems to push a lot farther about uh be more daring somehow about the uh divine nature of jesus than uh, yeah. some of these other stories yeah the i am statements are unique to john uh all of them yeah Faye, you are uh one of the things that stands out to me here is just the mystery and yeah. god just keeps telling us you don't know who i am you don't know what i do you don't know what i know and sometimes it's it's hard to accept that mystery it's hard to not be able to understand but that's what keeps me coming back is that mysterious um, element to Christianity that that just makes it bigger than me. Yeah, and the bigger than me is what keeps drawing me to it. I said I, I remember I formulated a long time ago this idea that a god, any god of any religion, that I can fully compass with my mind, it's not much of a god at, at all. It's not a God that's any bigger than I am. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I push toward and, and live in that mystery. I, I certainly agree with you there. Well, the other thing, I, other thing I want to mention is, I, as always, I, I identify very much with the, with the disciples. And, uh, I, you know, I, I thought the reaction is quite on target. You know, it's whatever, Jesus, you're our guy. You know, it's kind of like in a, you know, okay, Lord, I don't, we don't get what you just said, but you're amazing, and we're with you. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of like what have they reacted to it, which uh, seemed very uh, true to life to me, true to, yeah. true to human nature. And, and you know, I like some of the notes, because in John's Gospel, you'll also see a lot of, and that's one of the things that came, comes up in this, that you, you, you see a lot of snide, not snide, you see a lot of... Uh, more specific, more targeted, angry uh, comments about Judas. I mean, referencing Judas. It rarely calls. I don't. I don't think. I don't think he ever calls him by name. But he uh, maybe once or twice. But clearly referencing him. And you see one of those here. And I've often thought about that because, according to our stories, John is the only disciple who was at the cross. Um, and at the cross, he was entrusted with Mary and, uh, you know, church history tells us he took Mary with him to Ephesus and was there till she reposed. She lived with him in his house. Uh, he was the one who was there through the entire thing. And so when you hear his even even much much later when this gospel is written the betrayal by judas really really bothers him you can see that in the way that he talks about judas the way he talks about that betrayal and that shows up in this passage too yeah brother Dan. Um, it's interesting, it's a minor point maybe, but in this passage, Jesus says, uh, no one can come to me unless it's by the Father. Mm -hmm. But elsewhere he says, no one can come to the Father except by me. Yeah. Almost, I don't know, a contradiction or a uh, completion or, or what would you say about that?
Yeah, well, I mean, that's the tension that I, that I mentioned where everything that we have pushes back that this is one God, but three persons and, oh, and yeah. three very distinct persons that act as one God. Um, and that doesn't make sense. And so the statements that go in either direction contradict each other. You can't, yeah, it, it does say that elsewhere and it says that here and they do contradict each other uh, from what we can understand because, but, but we also can't really understand the Trinity uh, either. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it is that mystery that's important. Uh, you know, the mystery of the Eucharist, I find it interesting because I've read now a lot of the of the writings uh, that we have from well throughout all of church history, because that's the way that I you know, whether it was uh, Advanta uh, Hinduism uh, or you know different things like that. That's kind of the approach that I took reading a lot of material. So I read a lot, and what I notice is that nobody tries to resolve this tension. They they declare. And they talk about what it means that this bread and wine, that it's body and blood. And they declare that it's bread and wine and it's the body and blood. Nobody tries to explain how that is uh, until we get to Thomas Aquinas, who uses Aristotle terms of, uh, of substance and accidents. And a lot of people misunderstand transubstantiation, that it's kind of, you know, bread and wine is transformed and, and it becomes body and blood, uh, actual body and blood, but that's not how Aristotle uh, works. Uh, it, it, the accidents, the part that we actually sense and everything else that remains bread and wine, but Aristotle separates that from the substance. And so his explanation is that using those, that framework, the Aristotle's framework, that the substance, the reality behind the accidents becomes the body and blood. But that's the first time somebody actually tries to make, come up with a philosophical explanation that I found, and I've read a lot from the first thousand years. And I haven't found anyone until then who tries to come up with an explanation. And then after that, we get a lot more. You know, Later we get Luther with consubstantiation and we get Calvin's idea of a spiritual meal uh, based on the belief in the text. And we get Zwingli's um, idea that it's just a, a, a that it's entirely figurative, that it's just bread and wine and nothing else is involved. And it's just so that we remember it and uh, live in it. And if you read Anglican and uh, the, the interesting thing about Anglican and Episcopalian uh, theologians is they're just all over the place. They kind of remind me of Jewish rabbis in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get every, every the whole spectrum of, of, of opinion and belief. All, you know, although the thirty nine in the thirty nine articles, yeah, uh, it de definitely speaks against the idea of transubstantiation. Yeah, yeah. you know that that's probably the only real clear statement. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. it's like we can argue about everything else, but don't. The but the, but it's, not, it's not that Roman Catholic thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is an option, just not that. <laughs> so I'm listening to, I'm thinking about this, this, uh, the statement that uh, Father David brought up. And it's one that has always bothered me because I read that sentence about, or those, the places where it comes up about no one can come to me unless they come through the Father, and no one can come to the Father unless it comes through me. And, but it's based, so, so many Christian denominations have taken that to mean the only way to heaven, the only way to be connected with God is through Christ. It's a very exclusionary interpretation. And that, and I, you know, it's easy to read it that way. I do. And then I don't like it. So I just kind of reject it. But uh, so I'm, I'm interesting. Um, but that's part of the tension because later on in John, 
you know, when he's doing the discourse in the upper room, he says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, obviously he's talking about the cross, but mm-hmm. they don't know that yet, uh, will draw all things to myself. <laughs> all things. All things. So, <laughs> so whatever's out there, it'll yeah. all come through me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 That. That tension uh, in that statement really, um, it's very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, John challenges you again and again with tensions, with things that you can't resolve. Uh, I think that's one of the things that appeals to me so much about his gospel is he sets up things and does not allow you to make sense of them. That's one of the things that um, I recall the, you know, theological, biblical discussions from uh, my theological training at Iona School. It's just this whole concept of Christian faith is is a faith of paradoxes. Mm -hmm. That um, absolutely that it's that tension that you're talking about. There's this and there's that. Both are right, but you can't really equate them they they look like they're opposing to us and you have to believe them both yeah yeah and the thing is is that when a tradition a a tradition or practice loses that tension when they lean in either direction their practice the way they live tends to suffer Uh, we see that again and again and again over over christian history um, there's something about losing that tension, losing that mystery, losing that magic, losing that opposition, failing to hold both of them, to keep pushing against both of them, that then tends to live, tends to, what we see in Christian life and Christian practice in those groups over time tends to go in directions that doesn't look right to us. And it gets corrected, you know, eventually, but that, that seems to happen over and over again when we lose, when we lose that, th- those oppositions, that, that, that tension, those two poles driving us. And, and it's not just two, because Christianity sets up all these apparently opposing tensions. And, and, and it tells us the resolution to all of them is love, mm, love mm-hmm. God, love others. Uh, and, and that's one commandment. I mean, a lot of times we talk about it as two commandments and, and it's the way he puts it is kind of, you know, uh, the second is this, but when he's saying that he's answering the question, what is the greatest commandment? And what he's saying is that, well, it really has two parts. <laughs> Yeah. Which also is not unusual in the context, because a lot of people in, in the first century, in, in you know the first century BCE, in that whole time frame, one of the things, discussions that we see again and again in different non-Christian writings uh, with Jewish uh, writings and, and different things like that are trying to say, because the Shema, which uh, an Israelite is supposed to say on, you know, you, in Deuteronomy is, you know, the idea is you say it when you, uh, at the beginning of your day and at the end of your day, you know, as hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. We will love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your body. And so a lot of the discussion was, okay, well, how do you love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your, (laughs) with your whole being? How do you do that? What does that look like? And one of the things, uh, I think it was in Hillel's school, uh, was the, that you do that by love, love of neighbor and embrace of the stranger. Um, Jesus obviously is in that tradition, is in that school, but he Mm -hmm. pushes it much further. Uh, in his in his parables and his teaching, he pushes it to the extreme to love your enemy, love the one who is harming you. <laughs> so I'm also wondering, in terms of if, if um, Jesus, in his dialogues with 
and his uh, reprimands to the Pharisees as being hypocritical and just being show-offy play actors that he's talking that he's pointing out to them that they have lost sight of that tension of the mystery of God and the living into the faith of God. Yeah. I mean, and he was, he was disputing the ones he felt was getting it wrong. He, mm -hmm. he, he felt they were wrong and he was doing it as a rabbi. Yeah, that's what everybody called him. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was operating in that tradition. Uh, rabbi is, is, Rabone is the term developed for the teachers in exile in the synagogues. Uh, um, I mean, he's clearly operating within that tension. He's not a Sadducee. He's not a mm -mm. Herodian. He's not, you know, <laughs> he's not an Essene. He's, you know, and he's clearly not a zealot. Um, he's operating within that tradition. Um, so he's calling it out. Yeah. He's calling and he's calling, but, he, but it's not just that they've lost the way. He, he calls out the ones that he feels are leading the people astray or taking advantage of them. I mean, that's really his problem at the temple is that they've turned it into, um, you know, somebody brought a poor person brought you know their two doves because that's all they had well the you know, the priests would declare them um to have a defect and not be acceptable and they'd have to go get the doves that are being sold outside the temple uh but then they couldn't even use their money to do it because you had to use money in the temple so they had to change their money to the temple coins um before they could get the doves that would then be accepted uh, so, you know, that, that's the, those are the sorts of abusive practices at the temple that he was calling out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, his, his problem was not. Yeah, not, not with all, but the ones that he's pointing out. I see right. Anne, Anne has her hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah. You're muted, Anne. Oh, you're, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to be clear that I heard that I heard this right. So Vic and Victoria, will you help me, please? Um, I'm trying. We were talking about Jesus. So, and I got lost. So, I mean, and I got lost with the part where you, you can't come through the Father unless you come through me and you can't, that part. Why is that a problem? I, why is that a discussion, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. We, thus, the Episcopalian faith, don't we believe in the Trinity? We believe in the Trinity. We believe in Jesus as God, the, the incarnation of God. Okay. That he's fully human and fully God. Yes. The part where I get bothered with it, I mean, that is God. And, you know, at least... In my personal theology, God reveals himself in many ways. God cannot be confined. Correct. So um, there, you know, God revealed himself to Abraham. He revealed himself to Ishmael. Yes. He revealed himself to the Muhammad. He revealed himself to Buddha. I mean, and I may be very heretical here, so please forgive me, but I just don't see that I just cannot confine God to only one expression of God. God is, um, we, I believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the full incarnation of God. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't take away from my belief, but I, I, it's just that I have this, this, this sense that one cannot confine God. Okay. Then I guess that I don't understand what that means then to confine him, or maybe it's just that I have it. Well, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of street preachers out and about, 
and uh, other preachers out and about that say the only way that you can get to heaven, the only way you can find God is okay. to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the only way. Okay, now I, now I so, understand. And they use the, the, these statements as part of their battery of ammunition for justifying sure. the approach. Now I, now I see what you're talking about. The, the, there, are, there are all sorts of groups from more inclusive to less inclusive, but yeah, there's, there's a whole process and a whole, you, you can get to very, very, very narrow groups that define really there's just this tiny little handful that are actually uh, going to be whatever they mean you know whatever any particular group means by being uh, sure. saved well, I think I would say that uh, Dave, what David started out with uh, shows that God is not and, and Jesus is not confined that way I mm -hmm. mean he pointed out at the very beginning sometime, at one point it says no one comes to the Father except through me that is, no comes to me with the Father. Well, if they're both aspects of God and components of God, if no one comes to Jesus except through the Father, that means every all these that gives room, I would think, uh, Deacon Victoria, for all these other expressions, all the ways to find God, you know, um, and um, people can can come to come to uh, a belief in the uh, uh, a loving God uh, through through a way that go, you know ends up at at uh, a belief that's a, a equivalent to, uh, to a, a belief in Jesus. I, I'm not expressing myself very well, but I, I guess I, I didn't see a conflict with, with what David you were saying. I think to me that those two statements are reconciled in the mm -hmm. fact that God and Jesus are aspects of are both God the Father and God the Son are both aspects of God. So there's, I don't see any conflict in those saying those two things, saying saying it those two different ways. There are two two ways of saying the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the problem then becomes when you say aspects of God, because we believe in one God. And if you start dividing God into aspects, you now have uh, little gods. Uh, well, so I yeah, got, that's that's one of the tensions in Christianity. I gotta it's use, one of the I things you use, have to I gotta push use against. Words. I got to use some words. Scott, yeah, yeah, you, know? you do. You do. <laughs> but but then you, you also have to point out the flaws in those those words or you lose some of that tension that, that we don't have language. Uh, and there's no there's no place where we've ever had language that, that captures, and, and I think that's part of the tension that shows up in the statements is that Jesus is is expressing the idea, and the idea is not actually in opposition, but the language sounds opposing. It sounds like the directions get reversed, um, and it sounds limiting. Um, can sound limiting. People certainly plenty of people have taken it that way. Uh, but that's just limitation of language trying to express it to, to, to people. Yeah, Lori? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, how you were saying you read a lot of things. I have too. And I think when you read the Quran or you read the Talmud or you read the Dada Ching, you see that God has been there in the writing. It's, it's present there. The understandings, the speakings, the words are there that they have been inspired by God or God has been there. Father David had something. Yeah. Yeah, uh, slightly different approach, a historical approach. When Jesus is speaking to his audience, none of them probably have ever heard of North America or Australia. <laughs> or the people of the Ibjewe, or the Russians, or I know there's a story about Jesus having maybe gone to India and studied a bit, but that's not really proof. But I wonder if this is not much more localized than we tend to feel we have to make it. And that is, I've told you that you can only come to the Father by me, meaning the people that he's talking to right there and all the people he knows of on earth, which probably is only around Palestine and maybe further, but certainly not most of Africa or Russia or North America or Australasia, uh, where people still it existed at that time. So I, I feel that Jesus is speaking the truth as he sees it to the group 
or the culture that he knows. Mm. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Oops, didn't mean to create silence. No, I'm just thinking about it. But yeah. You know, that just brings out, uh, Father David, that uh, one of the problems of us, of us in our culture, you know, here we are, our United States American culture in 2021, the 21st century, reading this very ancient text that has been translated in multiple different times in multiple ways. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we can't get the context. It's really important to try to remember the context. And, well, and the context. Too. Yes, yeah. So I think that's a real important point with this statement that I've always had some difficulty with is, is you know, who's he talking to? Who's the audience? Mm -hmm. It's certainly not the... The Runta people of Australia or the Comanche people of what is now Texas mm -hmm. or the Anglo-Saxons. So that's uh, something that I often like to meditate upon. And it helps me when I take these words and use them for myself. Well, is anyone ready to tar and feather me? No, no. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I was I'm sure we're all swapping we're all swapping heresies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about how there's so many in all these different religions and philosophies, there are so many similarities of statement of faith. So many, um, you know, what's in the Bible is not unique simply to Judeo-Christian theology. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you can find it in most every other world religion and, and theolo uh, theologies and philosophies. Sure. The origin of the phrase Judeo-Christian in the... 19th century is a problematic one and I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of Jewish people push back against that um, I try to just use Christian when I mean Christian and Jewish when I mean Jewish um, because they're not the same well I actually was referring to there are things in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament that you see across the world as well as things in the New Testament that's why I put that two together. But du duly noted, Scott, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just a place I try to be. And that's kind of the approach that I bring to all. And perhaps part of that is because, you know, I've, to varying degrees of faithfulness and depth, I've practiced different religions um, over the course of my life, is that I don't try to make them the same i accept their differences they they say the ones i mean and, and here i'm talking about the religions that have lasted thousands of years yeah um there are points of congruence there are th places where they will say similar things there are also places where they say very very different things and ultimately, they tend to say different things about the nature of reality, the nature of what it means to be human, and the nature of whatever they may or may not consider divine. Um, some are closer than others, some are further away, but they're not the same. And I respect that difference um, and try not to equate them, try not to say that, that everything is the same because because it's not. With that said, from my Christian perspective, I believe that God cannot be confined, is always at work in all humanity, and that different religions where they see things that are the same, I believe they're seeing the truth of it. And I'm not even, and I don't even think any of us as Christians 
any Christian theologian has gotten because we have a God bigger than we can describe, that we can compass. I don't believe that we have any examples, even our best minds that have accurately and thoroughly and completely described God. Um, <laughs> um, but that God is working in all things. And I believe the text where uh, in the gospels, where Jesus makes the statement that I referred to in places where Paul says the same things, that God is making all things new. In John's apocalypse in the end of it, uh, where the city of God comes down and earth are created. And even then the healing of the tree, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations and the people of God in this, from the city of God go to work. You know, it's all imagery, all metaphorical, continue their work of becoming more like God and of healing creation in the world. That work never ends. Um, and so that I believe that, 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 that God is in the business of saving all things, of, of doing all things. But I recognize that I believe that. And I respect the fact that other people believe different things about the nature of reality. And some of them I've practiced and I understand better. Uh, and I still draw things from it. I still read Buddhist writers. Uh, I, I, part of my meditations periodically is the Tao Te Ching. Uh, because I see new things in it every time that I do it. And it, from beginning to end, takes the tension of holding oppo apparently opposing ideas in tension and believing both. Um, that's, that's inherent in it. Um, I, I just wanted to put that out there, that I don't try to, to say that all religions are variations of the same or, or Christianize them. I allow them to be different and at the same time say, I, I've chosen the Christian perspective, and I believe God is working through all of this, and, it, and in some way that I don't understand, will make all things new. Uh, and I could be wrong. <laughs> I, there I've is said, the tension. <laughs> yeah. I've said this before, that a good definition of God for me is that God is a circle whose center is everywhere, and whose circumference is nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Impossible to define. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Impossible to compass, to limit, to compare. Yeah, comp yes. Yes. But then that's, they say again, uh, a God that is understood is no God at all. Yeah. Is, is no God. <laughs> and, you know, some of the gods in in smaller religions that that have not lasted have been like that. Um, mm -hmm. We see that in human history, um, and those religions tended tend to have only lasted a few hundred years, maybe at most. Mm -hmm. The ones that the ones that uh, have endured don't. They don't. They're not that small. Yeah, none right. of them. Well, as I would want to expand on what I said, sure, Jesus was talking to the people around him, his group, his culture, his country. But that didn't prevent other people from taking what he said and going with it and yeah. believing it and living yeah. it and expanding it for the centuries and for the whole world. Yeah, so, to the point where it's now the largest religion in the world. I mean, yes, yeah. We can't say that it's just a local <laughs> thing that took place in uh, Palestine or something. Of course yeah. not. Because it does reverberate through the centuries and through a lot of people's hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. End of sermon. <laughs> and a good sermon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Two minutes. Yeah, did anyone else have any thoughts? I didn't really expect to get anywhere other than John's Gospel tonight. Uh, <laughs> that's why I started there. <laughs> well, there was a lot to unpack. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you did it well. Oh, thanks. Like I said, I, I love this. This particular section is, is even out. I love John's Gospel totally, but, you know, all of it. But this particular is one of the parts that I especially love, John 6.
Did anyone else have any other closing thoughts? Close. Anyone at all? Okay. Would anyone like to close us in prayer then? Well, let's invite Father David to close us with oh, prayer. Okay. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> Let me think. Let me look up some books. And... <laughs> Good Episcopal answer. <laughs> right off the top of my head. Okay, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time together, for the freedom and knowledge to speak our thoughts, to speak our minds, and to be able to trust one another with what we share. This is a friendship that is most valuable to us and that we thank you for. Thank you for all the blessings of this life. And we pray for all those that are so in need of your love and of your beneficence. Be with us all as we walk our ways through this life, knowing you through your body, through your mind and through ours also. In Christ's name we pray as we thank you and ask for your blessings this night. Amen. 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 Thank you so, very much. Thank you. So Father go David. forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 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 Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. Thank you so much.